Joining us tonight from the City of Angels, he's one half of the greatest tag team of all time, the Fantastics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Bobby Fulton. Bobby, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. And Jonathan, I'll tell you what, your check is in the mail. Your check is in the mail, <laughs> and it'll be email. But you... <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take it. Uh, we appreciate I you coming you. on. Yeah, man, it sounds great. You know, uh, talking about the Fantastics, uh, I'm just I'm excited about being on your program tonight. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, now, uh, uh, Bobby, you know, you're a legend in wrestling. Uh, you got your start uh, wrestling at the age of 16. Uh, what made you yes, sir. What made you want to get in the business in the first place? Can do you remember? Well, well, I'll tell you what. I remember passing by a TV, and back then, I grew up in Chillicothe, Ohio. I could, it was, it was like an orchestra to me. It was the crowds cheering in a little TV studio, the sound of the rain making the noise it makes when guys go down. Then the commentator was saying, and now it's a collar and elbow tie-up. Then he goes into a hammerlock. And to me, it was like a symphony. And I was hooked from the first time I seen it. As a matter of fact, my I just seen my little league baseball coach uh, not long ago, and he said, I'll use you as an example because I asked you when you were nine years old at Mary Lou Patton Park in Chillicothe what you wanted to be when you grew up. And you said, I want to be a professional wrestler. I want to travel the world. And... Uh, from the time I seen it, I started setting up the rings for a promoter that had been with Al Haft. And anybody with the wrestling history knows the history of Al Haft uh, in Ohio. And he was one of the original, original founding members of the National Wrestling Alliance years and years ago. As a matter of fact, he was an Ohio State uh, wrestling coach for, for Ohio State, uh, the Ohio State. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, so I broke in the wrestling business. But, you know, Steve, it was a lot different in the 70s when I broke in. Mm -hmm. you, I was breaking into a business that no one wanted you to break into. Yeah. You were an unwelcome person to come into their, their business. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's a lot different from the day. But, but uh, to cut myself off, uh, I started from the first time I ever seen professional wrestling. And I grew up watching the Sheik, but what was there, Wild Bull Curry, Flying Fred Curry guys like that. No, this from the get go. Sure. Well, you just mentioned a few of them, but would you consider uh, those guys some of your favorites back then, or were there anybody else? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, what was really strange was you you you've heard of Wild Bull Curry, right? Oh yeah. Yep. Have you ever heard? And everybody's seen him with the big eyebrows and the big <laughs> color flowered yeah. ears. Well, not only did I see him on TV after I broke into the business at 16, I started wrestling him. Right. And then I was flying Fred Curry's traveling opponent, meaning that when people would book him on a show, on an outlaw show back then, I was the guy that went with him that wrestled him. And as a matter of fact, eventually it got to where you can go on YouTube and see Bob Fulton versus Steve Travis from Allentown and, and uh, Hamburg, uh, the TV tapes. I used to go up and do them. As a matter of fact, my night of graduation, I was doing, uh, doing uh, the WWF television and everything so so uh yeah the sheik was my favorite of course wild bull curry flying fred curry you know uh guys like that pam pearl furpo and you know wrestling back then not everybody looked alike i mean the sheik had his thing wild bull curry had his thing bobo everybody had mm -hmm. a different thing going on when they got into the ring Even before they got into the ring they were already a character <laughs> that's right now uh once you made up your mind, you know, you said at age nine, you already had made up your mind, yes. but at 16 is when you started wrestling. Um, how did you go about looking for a trainer? I would imagine it was a little more difficult back then than it is today. There was no trainers. There was no wrestling school. As a matter of fact, after reading books and stuff like that and talked to Les Thatcher, he had explained, uh, yeah, I found out Tony Santos in, up in Boston that had a wrestling school years before that, but as I said, you were unwanted. They didn't want you in the wrestling business. And as a matter of fact, the guy I set the ring up with wouldn't even break me in. Wouldn't even wouldn't even let me in the dressing room. Wouldn't wouldn't allow us to be in on anything. And that's just the way they protected the business back then. But what happened was before the internet, there was wrestling newsletters being sold throughout the country in fan clubs and stuff like that. And a guy by the name of Ken Jugan who wrestles a Zoltan, my friend was a pen pal of his. 
and he explained that they were starting a wrestling company in West Virginia. I wrote him a letter and said, I'd love to be a wrestler. And he said, well, then come on. So me and a guy named Mad Dog Michaels in our first match, and I talked to guys later that was in it. And as a matter of fact, his name was Joseph Shedlock. He, we went out there and wrestled our first match, and it seemed like 15, but it was only four. And the whole dressing room came out and pulled us apart. And Ken Jugan said, actually, it was one of the better, better matches on the card, which, of course, I'm sure he just exaggerating. But those guys thought we were going to kill each other, and perhaps we may have because I really didn't have any training, and I don't think Joseph Shedlock had any training. So on the way down there, my dad had went to school with Ray Stevens, the crippler. A lot of professional wrestlers came from Ohio. And my dad, I told my dad on the way down, I said, Dad, if this ain't on the up and up, I'm not going to be in this. He said, son, if it's not on the up and up, it gives you more reason and longevity to stay in professional wrestling. So my dad drove me around. He was a big supporter of me, my mom and him. My mom said it was just a phase I was going through, and I'm 55, and I'm getting ready to wrestle Sunday night. I'm not out of that phase. Now, speaking of that, traveling a little bit, you know, you spent a lot of time traveling the roads, going from territory to territory. Uh, yes, did you did, did you did you enjoy that kind of lifestyle, or was it just kind of, you know, hectic, and you just rolled with the punches? I'll tell you what. I, I love that kind of lifestyle. And as a matter of fact, uh, when I left home, I left home with very few dollars in my pocket in a dream. And there was times I slept in my car. There was times I made $5, sometimes no money. I, when I graduated, my dad asked me to do one thing, graduate high school, which I did Southeastern high school in Richmond, Dale, Ohio. I graduated. And as soon as I did, I left home and I went to Kentucky and wrestled for an outlaw Later, Later it was to become independent and independents are thriving today. Uh, but I, uh, I uh, didn't mind the lifestyle. I still have a bit of gypsy in me about staying in one place. Sure. It became a lifestyle, and, and, and I like the newness of new areas. And a lot of people, you know, and I ask you, what was your favorite place? Well, every place had its good things and bad things. Mm. But if you could lump all the good together, it would be great. You know, uh, oh, yeah. every, every territory had its good good. It made its majors and its minors. Sure. Now, do you have maybe uh, any funny stories from the road that you could probably tell us? Maybe one that sticks out in, in your mind. Oh, I could. I, I could <laughs> tell tell you hundreds and hundreds. I'll give you one. I'll give you. I'll give you two real quick. Okay. Magnum TA. We were we were in Louisiana, and me and Terry Taylor. We were uh, <laughs> we were riding with Magnum, and Magnum was really driving a Mustang GT, and Magnum was training hard. You know, he was a machine and. And I looked over there at Magnum, and Magnum said, yeah, I got, uh, I got uh, a 50, 56 inch chest. And I was pretty kind of barrel chested, you know, I mean, short, but barrel chested. I said, really? I said, yours is uh, 56. I said, mine is, <laughs> is about 54 and a half, right? Yeah. And then we're driving down the road, and all of a sudden he said, uh, he said, well, my arms are about 19. I said, well, that's funny. Terry says his is 17 and a half, and his looks a lot bigger than yours. <laughs> and it busted <laughs> Magnum, I mean, as far as just his ego shrunk driving. You know what I'm saying. But one of the, one of the and, and it might not have been funny to a lot of people, but it struck me as funny because back then, Magnum was very, very determined in his career, very serious, not a lot of, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of time for joking. I mean, he's a fun guy and a nice guy, but also at the same time, he was very serious about his craft. Now, one time, me and Bill Dundee and Tommy Rogers was driving in Louisiana, and Louisiana was a lot of two-lane roads. And people don't realize that, but we wrestled nine times a week. I mean, yeah, nine times a week in nine different cities and drove 3,000 miles a week. So we were driving one night, and we'd stopped off in the middle of nowhere to pee, and we got in the car, and Dundee got back in the front seat. Well... I, we're just talking and we drove off. Well, we got about 45 minutes down the road or 30 just talking. And Dundee says, where's Tommy? I said, what do you mean? He said, he's not back there. I said, you're joking because I was driving hundred miles an hour. <laughs> I'm filling around the back seat for him, filling around the back seat. Finally, we, I realized he ain't there. Now we don't know where we left him in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana. So we turned around and followed the same road back driving hundred miles an hour Four, 45 minutes back and finally we seen Tommy because of the back then there was no cell phones 
there was a, there was a, he said that because of the moonlight, he could barely see the yellow line. And every, all the wrestlers carried these black bags back then, and I'm sure perhaps some still do. And so his wallet, his ID, and everything was in the car. And when I finally got to him, he just couldn't believe it, and he was tickled to death. But the funny thing, I said, well, what happened? He said, well, what happened? He said, uh, when Bill Dundee jumped in the car, my his he had a bottle of uh, beer. It rolled off the car, and all of a sudden, so I guess that noise or whatever. So when Dundee got in, I pulled up a little bit. His door automatically shut. So I thought Tommy Rogers was in the car. Long story short, but to me, that was kind of funny. I sure. mean, you know. <laughs> I'm 55, guys, and, and my humor might not be like no, y'all's it's funny. humor, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, many, many, many different times uh, things happened along the way. And, I mean, you know, sometimes you think back and you go, man, I just, I can't believe I lived through that. <laughs> 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 you sure. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, everything. So, uh, but that was too, and, and the reason why it struck me about Magnum was funny. It was just because Magnus, Magnum's seriousness and what a great guy he, he is. And I see him, you know, uh, on some of these uh, interviews and, I mean, uh, autograph signings and stuff. And we see him in Charlotte every year with his uh, family. And uh, what a super great guy. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just talked with Terry Taylor the day before yesterday and just kind of reminiscent of some of the good old days, you know, how that goes. Absolutely. Now, um, obviously, you spent a lot of time, we said, on the road, and we know yes, that sir. you were in pretty much every territory that was worth mentioning. Uh, you went yes. to Calgary, you were in Memphis, you were all over. Yes. Um, did you have a specific territory that you enjoyed working in the most, or did they all kind of have their own uh, ups and downs? Well, I'll tell you what, they all, like I said, when I talk about living in a place they all have their ups and downs. They all have their good stuff. I, I was in Calgary, Alberta, keep in mind, in 1980, when I would watch Dinah and my kid go out and wrestle for 30 minutes. He would do a diving headbutts to the concrete floor. He would come back, and he would do a 1,000 Hindu squats after his 30-minute match. He was a machine. And, I mean, I, to me, and, I mean, I know you didn't ask this, but I'll just say, he, to me, he's one of the greatest wrestlers that ever stepped in the ring. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean, for his, his acrobatic, his wrestling style. And I seen him and Steve Wright in the match in Calgary, Alberta. And Steve Wright was Alex Wright's father from England. And it was unbelievable to watch that match. But when you talk about Calgary, I was there and I wrestled Bret Hart. Well, see, before I got my arm broke in a riot, I was always a heel. I'm a hundred times better heel than I ever was a baby face. And, but when I broke my arm, my dimensions of my body changed. And of course, the promoters seen something else in me. And, you know, talking about territories, I wrestled in Memphis, got a chance to wrestle with a lot of great guys. And, you know, Steve and Jonathan, mm -hmm. Tennessee used to be the joke of the professional wrestling business. I mean, guys would say, oh, that Tennessee stuff, but Tennessee drew big money. And I'm talking about seven, eight, nine thousand every. Month ten thousand and every Monday night in Memphis, Louisville drew. Uh, they had Jerry the King Lawler, who's still going strong today. Superstar Bill Dundee, Terry Taylor, the fabulous one, Stan and Steve. I mean, uh, Dirty Dutch Mantel. What a great territory to work in. Uh, one of the hardest territories, though, had to been Bill Watts because it was like a cattle drive. And years later, looking back on it. I said, Bill Dundee, I mean, Bill Watts, well, Bill Dundee was a booker when I was first there. Bill Watts had to be the master of taking guys that were basically, a lot of them, rebel-type guys in the wrestling business that didn't care for authority and be able to push them the extra step to uh, bring out the best in them. I don't know if you guys understand what I mean. And then, of course... Uh, uh, with Louisiana, we went to Dallas, Texas with the Bon Ericks and, uh, that, that was on fire. But my first break came in San Antonio, Texas and Luke Williams and Jonathan Boyd were the bookers there. Butch Miller was there and that territory was unbelievably great. And as a matter of fact, I walked in there coming out of Tennessee training. She built and D got me going to the gym. Steve Kern and guys like that taught me about training and eating right. 
Kerry Taylor and all these guys. And when I walked into San Antonio, I was a pretty good looking guy. And Joe Blanchard looked at me and he said, listen, he said, when I see a man, I either see no money, little money or big money. And that's all he said to me. Mm -hmm. I went and wrestled at the Hemisphere Arena that night in the first match. And you got to think this is 1982 or three. And they handed me $400 cash that night. And back then, that was a lot of money. In your career, you got to be the heel and the face. Which did you consider tougher uh, to pull off? Was it, you know, was one tougher than the other or in your mind? Yeah, Yeah, baby, baby face. And the reason why is because me and Tommy Rogers, the Fantastics, we were considered white meat baby faces. We could go all throughout the South. And I mean, everybody like us except for some of the guys because we were still in their girlfriends. And I remember the Patriot, <laughs> Dale Wilkes, told me when we'd come to Columbia, the guys from the uh, University of South Carolina would come to the matches there in Columbia and cuss us, not cuss us, but ran on us left and right, call us all kinds of names. But, but you know, when we went up north, I'll never forget, me and Tommy had came in from Japan, and we were up in uh, Philadelphia and was for Joel Goodhart. And I walked into the ring and I said, I got the microphone. I said, hey, y'all, thank you for walking us to the city of brotherly love. And, buddy, I'll tell you what, they booed me out of that. (laughs) (laughs) They hated hated white meat type baby faces up there. I mean, you know, and I mean, it's not a racial thing. And you understand, uh, it's just, just you know, you have your bruiser type baby faces or whatever. I mean, you know, up north it was harder for a guy like me to get over, especially my, my, not to get, to get the people to like me. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we've talked to a lot of different legends and, uh, wrestling personalities. And, uh, a lot of the older guys seem to think that the territory system is one of the reasons that wrestling was so good back then. You know, you didn't see the same people all the time and all that. Do you think not having the territories, uh, today is hurting the wrestling business? Or do you think that the territory system was, good for it back then but not so much no. needed today i think i think it's needed and i think with what vince has with the wwe i think if he has him a place in florida he needs to have them in different places uh, wrestling is alive and well wrestling i mean I, we just had a show here outside of my hometown chillicothe ohio we had 900 people in a population town of about 1500 we had 900 people there mm-hmm. They, we walked from each end and, and the people love the matches. Do you need the territories? Because listen, the only way one a school's okay, but you'll never learn until you get in front of a crowd. And if you can get in front of a crowd five, six, seven nights a week with guys that, that knows their stuff, you can learn that much better so that when you get up on the big stage or you're at ring of honor or you're at, WWE or some of these other organizations, you're more prepared there. And, and the reason why I say this is plus, I mean, you know, it's just like, for example, a guy, and I know Vince likes to give everybody their identities, and I don't know about how the Ring, Ring of Honor does, if that's something, but it's better when a guy picks three or four people and puts a little bit of his self in, and he feels comfortable with that role that he has then he's able to do it more. I'll never forget years ago, I went to Louisiana, and Colonel Christopher George Buckley Robley III was the booker. And and anybody that followed wrestling in the 70s and 80s have heard of Buck Robley. And I got to the territory, and he said, your name's Russ Jones. And I said, what? Hmm. He said, well, Russ Jones was supposed to come. So listen, listen here, I was only there for a short time. I never told no one my name because I didn't want to be called Russ Jones. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> so on the, on the downside, that was, that was, I didn't like that because he put that on me, but I definitely feel like they need territories to help guys learn. And I think that the staleness, and I'll give you, for example, I remember when I worked for Jerry Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett paid pretty good and people stayed for long times. Well, I'd also worked for Nick Bullis in Nashville, and Nick wouldn't hardly pay at all. So there was a constant turnover of professional wrestlers. Well, later the fans told me, so we like Nick Bullis' wrestling better because we got to see more different wrestlers. So when you're featuring guys on national television two times a week, 
I think they wear out quicker, don't you? Sure, yep. <laughs> and uh, I think that's why, and I'll tell you what, if I was in charge, I would be bringing enhancement talent back. There's a need for that on television because you, you have to get your guys over. You don't exploit your top talent on the, the TV program because then it's all of a sudden you're going, well, I don't already see that. Why am I going to watch a pay-per-view? Sure. What's going to make that any different? Exactly. Now, uh, Bobby, you know, you also spent the majority of your career in a tag team. Uh, why do yes. you think tag team wrestling was so important back then versus today, maybe? Well, we came out of Tennessee. And as a matter of fact, you know, you talk about uh, the different territories. I don't know why they don't major on tag team wrestling more now, because it's like this. In a single match, how there's only two guys in the ring. But in a tag team match, there's four guys, and there's so many different story, stories that you can tell during that particular t- part of that match and the intrigue and the interest. I, I don't know why they don't major, ma- major on the tag team matches anymore. I don't, I really don't. But, you know, back in the 80s, there was the Midnight Express. There was the Fabulous Ones, the Fantastics, the Road Warriors. Uh, my goodness. And, and, you know, a lot of teams that's never even mentioned that were great. Uh, oftentimes we'll tall and iron and all them, but, uh, but I think there's a need for that too, because it's like going to the circus and all of a sudden you're not having the guy come out of the cannon anymore, which is part of, part of the show. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I think that it's something missing that they should major on it more because I think the people get into it, but you see, they have to push that particular type of wrestling to get it re over again because it's been something lacking for many, many, for a long time. Well, you're, um, you know, you were paired with quite a few people throughout your uh, tag team career um, and, you know, some amazing tag team partners. You mentioned Terry Terry, Taylor earlier, but were you ever paired with somebody that you just didn't mesh well with? Well, not as far as the, not as far as the fantastics. And the reason being was before that I was always a, I was always a single wrestler, and as a matter of fact, what happened was for the Fantastics, um, they put us together in Louisiana as just a 90-day replacement team, but then the rest is history, of course. Uh, Terry Taylor was great, and we were just a little, uh, we were put together as a tag team in Georgia for just for a short time as an experiment, not on our tag team, but on that territory. They were trying to do a few new things, but Tommy Rogers, he was like magic. And I don't know if it's because him and I didn't consider ourselves as single wrestlers any longer when we became the Fantastics, but I knew he was my bread and butter and he knew I was his bread and butter. And being short guys, five foot nine, we were, we were, we weren't going to be featured in any main events without being in a tag team situation. You know what I mean, Steve? Oh, exactly. Jonathan. Yep. I am. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, you know, uh, speaking of the Fantastics, who would you consider your, uh, your greatest opponents during that time? Well, you know, a lot of people a lot of people will say that the, the, the Midnight Express, and we wrestled them in Louisiana, we wrestled them in Tennessee, we wrestled them for Jim Crockett Promotions. Also, the, the, the Sheep Herders, though, really helped establish us as guys that was willing to fight in those bloody barbed wire cage matches that was in the UWF years ago. As a matter of fact, at the first Crockett Cup, we, and I'm not saying it because it's me, but I've had thousands of people tell me, we, every top tag team in the world was there at that Crockett Cup in New Orleans. And people and the fans tell me that us, our, our semifinal match with the Sheep Herders stole the show of both nights. And uh, a lot of people don't give the Sheep Herders credit, and a lot of credit in a lot of ways, but they were blood and guts guys, especially the way they ended their careers, the Bushwhackers, you know, for uh, Vince and stuff like that. But, you know, we, we wrestled John Tatum, Hollywood John Tatum and Jack Victory. They were a great team. Eddie Gilbert and Sting. Me and Tommy Rogers had some of Sting and Ultimate Warriors' first matches. As a matter of fact, God rest his soul, Jim Helwick, thanked Tommy Rogers and I in his Hall of Fame speech for helping them. When they started, they started in Tennessee, and I mean, we wrestled Tully and Iron, and there was just so many, so many great teams. You know, Steve, you alluded to the fact that 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 back then it seemed like it was big, yeah. And there was great teams. I mean, uh, Lynn Denton and and Tony Anthony, the Grapplers. I mean, uh, 
um, Killer Brooks and different partners, and, and just so many different, Dr. Best, Steve Williams, Ted DiBiase. I mean, I could go on and on. And you know, one thing, one thing about it is, like I said, we had a heavy work schedule, and uh, I'll tell you what, we were coming back one night from the Norfolk Scope, and I'd never met Jim Barnett before in my life, but I'd heard of him because I'd been in the business for years. And this is after Crockett has sold out Turner's wrestling event. And we had wrestled that night, Paulie and Dennis Condry and Randy Rose. And we felt in our heart that they kind of laid down. You get them in the, uh, you have them uh, you try to get them to wrestle, but coming back from the match, coming back from the match, you realize that uh, that the match wasn't what you wanted to be. But I'll never forget Jim Barnett saying, saying that, uh, that, uh, you can't have a bad match when you work as hard as you do. So you know what I mean, guys, Steve and Jonathan. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I, I've i always wanted this, and I'm sure you get asked this question all the time. But um, as far as the Fantastics go, we've mentioned, you know, you've had feuds with some amazing tag teams. Um, is there anybody out there today or even in the past uh, that you wish the Fantastics would have gotten to wrestle in any across the entire world of, of wrestling, you know, WWE, WCW, is there any any specific teams that you wish that you guys would have had a chance to wrestle? Well, um, I'm just trying to think. Some of them that we didn't, you know, in my era, in my era, we got the chance to wrestle all the great guys that, that we had, uh, that we had uh, all the great teams. I just, uh, I had, for about seven, for about six years, I didn't follow wrestling. But I've started following it now, and I'd love to wrestle some of the talent that's that's uh, available uh, that's out there today. I mean, uh, they got the, to me the WWE is starting to uh, is starting to put together some teams, and I mean I like to wrestle the Usos. I mean, we, we and Tom, Tommy and I wrestled Alpha and Sika, the Samoans. We wrestled the Samoan SWAT teams and that's other team. But the thing of it is, um, there's a lot of great teams. That, uh, but I can't think of any right off the top of my head. That's terrible. Well, you know what? I love uh, the Wolves. Yes. I love the Wolves wrestling. <laughs> but when I seen Davey, Richard, uh, Davey Richards, I told him, I walked up to him, I said, you remember me? You, you remind me of Dynamite Kid in 1980. The guy's an awesome machine. That team is good. The Wolves, there's so many other guys uh, that I'd love to be a part of the team. And you know one thing about Tommy and I, and, and not just saying this, is that we had a chance we could wrestle any style flying around. I don't know if you all seen much of our stuff from old Japan. We wrestled the British Bulldogs, of course, and people like that. And the Malenkos, that's another team. Uh, Dean and Joe Malenko. A lot of people know Dean Malenko's wrestling in, in the States. and They don't know Joe Malenko's. And one of my favorite matches they just took off of YouTube now is the match with Joe Malenko and a guy called Kikuchi. And that was my go-to match, and people said, well, show me what you did, and it was at the Budokan, and I know I didn't answer your question, and I apologize about that. But but, there, but uh, I, think, I think, personally, if the Fantastics was brought up from the 80s to today, I think we could have a great match mm-hmm. with anybody, any tag team out there that's going today, and we could, we could hang with them. Absolutely. Definitely. Now, uh, you know, Bobby, uh, with things like uh, YouTube today and uh, High Spots has a streaming video yeah. and the WWE Network, uh, do you ever get a, to, to go back and uh, relive any of your old pa- or any of your past matches since they're so easily accessible today? Yeah, they are. And, and as my son uses the word relevant, and I, we get a chance to watch the matches and we really enjoy them. And not only that, but it's also letting people see us again. Where before, if it wasn't for uh, the WWE Network or if it wasn't for High Spots or if it wasn't for YouTube, those tapes would have been gone years ago. So people can look at those matches with the Midnight Express or the uh, Sheep Herders and all these guys and watch all this. Yes, I do quite often. As a matter of fact, we just got back from the gym. I'm 55 years old. I'm going to wrestle a year or so more. I'm doing like tons of flights of steps. And I'm feeling in the best shape of my life. You know, uh, I, I'm ready to go. I'm re- I, I can go wrestle anybody today. Obviously, I'm I'm biased. I would assume you are as well. Um, I think that the Fantastics are 
are uh, fantastic, pun intended. But thanks, thanks. I think that they um, they should be on. You know, they should be mentioned in the conversation of greatest tag teams of all time. Where do you personally see the Fantastics on that list of greatest tag teams of all time? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna just tell you this. If you took all of our matches with all the different people that we wrestled, you wouldn't find a bad match. And I forgot to mention Al Perez and Larry Zabisco and guys like that. We had, and it was but not just because of Tommy and I, we worked hard every night, mind you. But we worked, we wrestled against guys that could get in the ring and go also, and that, ma- that matters. I know that we did not do a lot of stuff in, in the WWF, and uh, yeah, up there to, to make our name bigger. But you know, I'm going to tell you what happened. My son can tell you this. A guy came up to us. I was over there. You know, my my Tom, my partner Tommy Rogers has passed away, and everything. But the thing of it is, a guy come up to me and he about started crying, and he said, "Man, you guys were unbelievable." He said, "You should be, you should be more at the top." than what people put you. And this was a person that I'd never even seen before. And it's because we just didn't, I guess we didn't get that, get that uh, run in, in New York. I mean, but you know, as far as tag teams go, everybody knows the road warriors are Legion of doom. And, uh, and guys like that, I, I think we're up there, but then again, I don't want people to say, well, you're, you're stupid for thinking that, but, the reason why I think that was it was out of passion that we worked hard and we wrestled hard and we got in the ring night after night and we, we gave them great matches. I don't care if we were in Tokyo, Japan or in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, if it was not the match of the night, it was close to it. And that's how we had our matches. And I tell everybody that we went to steal the show. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying. I don't want to say, I don't want to, I don't want to, I let the people say uh, where we'll be. I, I don't want to be arrogant. I'm very thankful. Listen, I'm going to tell you guys, I come from a small town, Chillicothe, Ohio. I had a dream at nine years old. I got a chance to live my dream and be 55 and live to tell about it when most of the people are gone. I mean, not to bring this thing down, but most of the people I wrestle with are gone from one reason or another. And I'm still alive and have the memories of the great times and uh, everything like that. You know, I, 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 I'll tell you what, anybody listening, I want them to let you guys know. Go watch the YouTubes. Go watch the networks. Go see the stuff and then come back in a couple of weeks and you tell us where you think we might be. Now, I know there's a lot, a lot of people on the Internet that can say a lot of harsh things because they're hiding behind the keyboard. But if honesty, if honesty, there was a lot of great teams. I mean, the Rock and Roll Express. Uh, but, you know, Jim Cornette, he says some of his best matches with the Midnight Express was with who? With the Fantastics. Fantastic. Definitely. He'll tell you that in different interviews. And as a matter of fact, Stone Cold Steve Austin said, we were one of his favorite tag teams when he was a, when he was a kid growing up. Uh-huh. And, I mean, to me, and like I said, when Jim Hellwick, the Ultimate Warrior, took time out two days before his death to thank Tommy Rogers. And the first he said, Bobby Rogers and Tommy Fulton. He said, no, no, no. It's Tom, it's Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I was never the type of person to have a match. And this is where I think a lot of guys today, they try to have a match that entertains them or the dressing room. I try, we tried to have matches that tore the houses down where people were standing, and you don't see that very often. But I also, my thing is this. I like hearing other people within our industry that says, man, that was a great tag team. And guys like you that do these shows that talk to a lot of people that, 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 that uh, say that. To me, that makes me feel great. That's better than any Hall of Fame that's better than anything is to hear someone say, man, you guys did a great job out there and we enjoyed your wrestling. That means so much to me. Definitely. Now, uh, Bobby, you know, uh, obviously 
Uh, professional wrestling is one of the toughest sports out there. Uh, what kind of injuries have you suffered throughout your career? Can you tell us? Well, yeah, well, you know, Terry Taylor, when I talked to him the other day, he told me he had four or five neck surgeries and stuff like that. I uh, had my nose broke a couple times. I've, uh, I've uh, probably suffered more concussions than I'd care to start counting. And, of course, we're finding out now the damages with that. Um, I, my shoulders have been uh, uh, dis, uh, not dislocated. I tore my rotator cuffs uh, and my shoulders. My fingers are pretty well messed up. My neck is shot. It's like sand, uh, like a, like a beanbag chair. You know what I'm saying? But I've never had a surgery. I've never had a surgery. And the reason why I've never took any cortisone shots I know my limitations. And it's like the other day after church, my son was helping me in a uh, restaurant, and I seen a cousin I hadn't seen in 10 years, and I could barely walk. But the day we were at the gym, I did 90-some flights of steps in about 15 minutes, and we trained. Wow. So I have good days and bad days. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm thanking God that I never had any serious surgeries. My partner, Tommy Rogers, at the end, and he told me this, and I'll share this with you. He was on steroids for probably 20 some years. And I'm not saying it knocking him, but he told me, he said, Bobby, I think a lot of my downfall for my health has been due to the steroids. He said, because here's the thing I took my, my, and of course the hips and I, and I, my hips kind of, but he had hip replacement, shoulder replacement, all these replacements and stuff like that. And he said, he thought, of course it was the bumps, but it was also the steroids and stuff like that that's, that he put in his body for years. And not knocking Tommy. I'm going to say this. Tommy was one of the greatest partners I could ask. He was asking about partners. What a great wrestler. He doesn't get his due either. And, I mean, I mean, anybody that's seen his matches and our matches, what a, we, I think we complimented each other with what I might be lacking in. He was majoring in. What he was lacking in, I was majoring in. But he was a tremendous, tremendous wrestler. But as far as injuries, on a good day, I can wrestle 30 minutes against a 20-year-old guy and leave them blown up in the dressing room, and I do it from time to time. <laughs> and I get a kick out of it. When they, I've taken pictures with them laying on the dressing room floor and me standing over them, <laughs> and they can't breathe. And that's a good feeling at 55. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, it was it was sort of announced in October of 2015 that you'd be – you know, retiring in 2017, 40 years yes. after your yes. debut. Now, um, yes. as your in-ring career starts to wind down, um, when you look back, what do you consider the the best part about your career? Maybe a, a few highlights of, of what you've done for the past 40 years. Well, one thing, I lived a dream. And for a man – a man to be able to say I've lived and living the dream. I think that's, I don't know how much I can add to that, but I will say this, that I got a chance to meet a lot of great people And the common thread to us is professional wrestling. I got a chance to meet some of the greatest fans in the world. As a matter of fact, I still try to stay in touch with people. Um, I got a chance to travel all over. I mean, we met Shimon Perez the prime minister of Israel, how many people can say that they met the prime minister of Israel? I mean, I just so many highs. And, 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 and one, one other thing I want to add that a lot of guys don't get to add the name, Eric Embry, me and him wrestled in the first scaffold match in Texas. And he stood on the edge of it and I would hit him and he would arch his body back over the edge of the, over the edge of the scaffold to where the crowd was, not where the ring was. And every time I start talking about this, guys, I start wanting to get down low because that scaffold on top was shaking. That was a highlight for me to be a part of uh, scaffold matches. Wow. And then, I mean, uh, we were in the and, – and, and I wrestled in the Superdome in New Orleans where they had the WrestleMania. I, I wrestled in the Texas Stadium that was there. Uh, well, no, no, they didn't have WrestleMania. Well, they did have WrestleMania but that was a couple of years ago, but – Last year in Texas, they had a a new stadium. And that was my first WrestleMania I ever been to. And, guys, I'm going to tell you something. I know a lot of people say a lot of bad things about Vince McMahon, but there's no Super Bowl football game nor World Series that can top the show at WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. 
stuff. From the light show, from the production, it is unbelievable. And I stood there in amazement and watched this of how we used to just think about it. We used to go all over and they'd have a ring chair set up. We didn't have new Titan Trons. We didn't have all this stuff. We didn't have the pyrotechnics and all the things. I remember going to the ring guys when there was no music played, but the music was this. As you walked out, you could start hearing them. If you were a baby face, you could hear them start cheering until the whole crowd got to see and they'd be cheering. That was the music. And I think kind of the music's taken that away uh, from the participation of that. And then also the hill was the same way. It'd be a chorus of booze going to the rain. And then I was there in the early 80s when uh, the Fabulous Ones got put together, the Rock and Roll Express first got put together, and uh, they started playing the music in the music videos. A lot of people don't realize that Tennessee pioneered, Memphis, Tennessee pioneered a lot of stuff in professional wrestling and get a chance to learn with some of the greatest, great, greatest wrestlers. But I think with professional wrestling, the best is yet to come. And I just can't wait to see what takes place with it. It's, it's alive and well, and uh, I am just tickled to death to get a chance to talk to you guys. I'm coming up to uh, New York and Pennsylvania, and I'm excited about seeing the fans in June up there, guys. Yeah, that's right. And yep. uh, getting yeah. a chance to go ahead. I'm sorry. No, yeah, that's right. That's what we were just going to say next, uh, that you know, uh, you'll know, you be appearing for our good friends at ESS Promotions on June 11th for uh, Legends of the Ring as well as Warriors of Wrestling. Then on June 12th, you'll, all, you'll be appearing at Pro Wrestling World. Uh, Bobby, what's your favorite part about coming to the East Coast and meeting the fans out here? Well, I'll tell you what, right now, we, we weren't exposed a lot. Well, television, we were, and with world-class television was all up in there and uh, things. So it's very rare that I do get a chance to come up there, but I always, I, I always get a chance to meet a lot of great fans and reminisce about days going by. Uh, that particular area has tremendous, tremendous fans that really come out and support it, and I know with Eric and everything, it's always top-notch, first-class, uh, top level, and I'm excited to get a chance to meet all the great wrestling fans up there. And I mean, my goodness, uh, there's not only going to be me, but there's going to be a lot of other wrestlers on hand and everything. And I'm going to get a chance to reminisce with guys like Dutch Mantel, who I mentioned earlier, and some of the and some of the other guys. Sting will be there, and some of these other guys. And like I said, we had Sting and all of the Warriors first matches, Tommy Rogers and I. So not only am I going to get a chance to see all the great wrestling fans, the true backbone of professional wrestling, that I'm going to get a chance to see a lot of great old friends up there. And I hope you two guys might get a chance to uh, come by because I'd like to meet you face-to-face, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, we, we totally appreciate that. And um, in this world of uh, social media today, uh, we want to let all the fans out there know where they can find you. Do you have... Uh, you know, website, Facebook, any of that stuff. I have Facebook. I have Facebook, and my son helps me do it. It's what the Twitter. The Twitter is the Bobby Fulton, and then he has has the public one, the Fantastic Finale, and then he has the other one that is Bobby Fulton, and it's James Hines. My real name's James Hines, and it's that. But but the Fantastic Finale, and what? It ends in two in uh, November 2017. My son is 17, and he's following my footsteps, and he's got me going out of this wrestling business at uh, at uh, <laughs> at uh, 2017. And I'm going to be prepared and ready. I have a lot of different business ventures that I'm getting ready to start, but I'm looking forward because listen, here's the deal, guys. I don't come up to to that part of the country very often. It's been about three or four years since I was here the last time. I want anyone that's listening to this to tell their friends that Bobby Fulton of the Fantastics spent close to 40 years of professional wrestling. I'm coming up to their neck of the woods, and I'm looking forward to meeting each and every one of them. I know they're going to have a lot of great memorabilia that I'm going to be signing and that people can bring and special opportunities, Eric, and uh, all the great folks up there. But the main thing of it is I can't wait to to uh, chat with them. Maybe they can tell me uh, – and reminisce with me some of the great stuff because, you know, we used to wrestle in Baltimore all the time, part of WCW. Had some great matches there with uh, the Midnight Express. As a matter of fact, we put Jim Cornette high up in a cage there 
many, many years ago and, uh, and uh, everything. And, and we'd wrestle in Philadelphia and stuff like that and all, all over that area. I got a chance years ago, Tommy and I used to go up for and wrestle in New Jersey, some in Bricktown and different places and stuff. But I'm excited about this June weekend coming up. It is the uh, 11th through the 12th, like you said. I want the people to uh, to uh, to uh, go and uh, and uh, make their plans now to come out and see me. Not only me, but a lot of great other wrestlers is coming up that perhaps they don't get a chance to see too often up there. And uh, and uh, like I said, it's it's a privilege to have been a part of the greatest sport in the entire world, bar none, and that is the king of sports, professional wrestling. Well, Bobby, uh, we want to say, you know, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, we hope to speak to you uh, again in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Jonathan. God bless you guys in your in your future show and uh, in in the future of it and everything. I wish you nothing but good things, and I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to uh, share a little bit about my career. And hey, a book is in the works, so hopefully uh, I'll have a book out later on and uh the people can find out through twitter and different things but thanks for your time and thanks for the opportunity god bless you guys